The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in for the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard this, that it was the Lord, he put on his clothes, for he was stripped for work, and sprang into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from the land, about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. Now this was the third time that Jesus was revealed to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Simon said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked where you would. And now that you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go. This was said to show by what death he was to glorify God. And after this, Jesus said to him, Follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let's pray. Remind us, Lord, that you come to us in all the ordinary places of life, not just in the hour of worship, but at work and at play, at school, on vacation, wherever our lives take us, you are there. And we are to live and serve you in all those places, in all those circumstances. Help us to be living witnesses to your love at work in the world. Now gather us around your word, help us to hear it, and in hearing it, help us to live. We ask and pray all these things in your name. Amen. From Psalm 30. To thee, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made my supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise thee? Will it tell of thy faithfulness? These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Friends, grace and peace to you today from God our Father, through our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There are some of the technological advancements that we've made in recent years that I am confident are a gift and a blessing from God. One of them is caller ID. I was driving along the other day and the phone went off in my car and I looked at the screen and it said somewhere in Ohio where I'd never even heard of the town and since I know no one in Ohio I assumed it wasn't 
important. It might have been somebody wanting to talk to me about the extended warranty on my car, or wanting to help me clear up my college debt, or my favorite, warning me that the arrest warrant was out for me because of social security fraud and I was going to be arrested that afternoon. But I usually let it go to voicemail. I figure if it's important, they'll leave a message. Of course, we can all, well, not all of us, but most of us can remember the day when that wasn't the case. When the phone would ring and you didn't have a clue as to who was calling, and so you just had to pick up. Most of the time, it wasn't all that important. It might have been somebody seeking information, or it could have just been a call from a neighbor or friend who wanted to visit. Of course, in the parsonage, whenever the phone rings, especially back in those days, and especially after a certain time of day, it usually wasn't a good thing to pick up the phone. I remember a Saturday night many years ago now, over 40 years ago now, when the phone rang about 8 o'clock. And on the other end was my high school friend, Mark Lund. I hadn't seen Mark since college. We did go to confirmation together and grew up at Bethesda together, and we both went to Iowa State, but he was in ag and I was in sociology, headed to seminary, and so by the time college was over, we drifted apart, and I hadn't heard from him in several years, but now there he was on the phone. And he said, Gary, can you come to the hospital? My wife is in hospital, and she might lose the baby. Well, I didn't know he was married or even that he was expecting, they were expecting a child, but I said, of course. And I made the flying trip from Williams to Ames in very short order, got to the hospital to be greeted by my friend who told me the bad news, that they were able to save Sherry, his wife, and they got the bleeding stopped, but they couldn't save the baby. She was gone. Never had a chance. And Mark was just numb. That was their firstborn. They had all kinds of plans, all kinds of hopes and joys, and all of that was not to be. And we sat there in the hospital for quite some time, trying to find a way to make sense of what had just happened because there is no good sense when the joy and the expectation of a child, especially the firstborn, ends in that kind of sorrow. There are no good answers. There are no catchphrases or ideas that allow you to feel anything other than terrible, heart-wrenching pain. A few days later, we stood at the graveside of little Jacqueline Ann Lund and we committed to the earth their firstborn, and we cried again. We wept there at the cemetery outside of Jewel for the loss that they were enduring. We all face that in one time or another, hopefully not so tragic and traumatic, but we all face the reality that we will cry out to God at some point in time and want to know why this thing has happened. It doesn't make any sense. It isn't right. We understand that death is real and that death will come for us, but we expect death to come when we're old and gray and we've lived our lives and there's nothing more to accomplish in this life and we're willing to lay down in death. But it is beyond imagining when it happens all too quickly and takes away a life that didn't, didn't even have a chance to begin. And it's like the cry of the psalmist that we just heard. What use is it, Lord, if I go down into the grave? Will the dust praise you? And we might feel like that. In fact, we do feel like that. We wonder, God, what purpose is this? And to be truthful, I find no purpose in it other than the death of a child 
a death unexpected, a death unwelcomed, a death unbidden. And it's easy at those times for the good news of the resurrection and the gospel to fall on ears that just aren't able to hear it. Because the pain is too great, the loss too severe. Jesus was never, never hesitant to step in where death had intervened. There were at least three places in the New Testament where he came to a home when it was already too late and yet raised three people from the dead, Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, and the widow of Nain's son, all of which who died much too early or died if Jesus could have been there. And the grief in those situations was as real as the grief and the sorrow in that emergency room in Mary Greeley Hospital in Ames all those years ago. It was a place in which our hearts ached beyond imagining and all we could see was death and what it had done. What it had done to Mark and to Sherry. What it had done to Jairus and to Mary and Martha and to the widow of Nain. It's easy sometimes for us to shove death off into the shadows because we prefer not to think about it. Or if we do think about it, we think about it as happening to someone else. Or if it does come into our lives, we hope and pray that it only comes rarely, but it comes. And the death and the resurrection of Jesus is to confront that kind of loss, that kind of sorrow, that kind of heartache and pain. One of the things that I was able to share with Mark and Sherry that night all those years ago was that the very first words out of the mouth of Jesus as he was dying on the cross was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew where they were at in that hour, feeling that emptiness and loss and that forsakenness by God. Jesus knew the grief and the sorrow of pain. It wasn't alien to him. In fact, he went down into it and suffered it in a way that was unimaginable for any of us to grasp. And in his dying and in his rising would defeat the power of death. It took many years for Mark and Sherry to get beyond that. I don't think they ever fully are beyond that. I don't think any parent who loses a child ever gets beyond it. But it gets to a point at which the grief is not so sharp and the hope begins to live again. And they were able to realize that though they lost this child without getting to know her, that they will get to know her. That death did not separate them from Jacqueline Ann forever. That yes, one day they will greet her in the kingdom and they shall see her and they shall know their firstborn as they were never able to do in this life. And they know that because Jesus, who cried out on the cross in desperation and desolation, also was raised from the dead and has promised to bring all those who have died out of the graves into life again. God blessed them with many other children and now grandchildren from the Facebook posts that I see from Mark online, and they're proud of all of them. But they still cling to the promise of seeing Jacqueline Ann again in the kingdom. And it is the promise that belongs to each and every one of us. All of us who have lost those we love to death, sometimes at the end of a long and full and rich life, and sometimes unexpectedly and unjustly and unfairly, we will all be with them again because Christ who was died is raised from the dead. And our grief, real as it is and heart-wrenching as it is here, is a grief that will one day be turned to joy. The wounds that death inflicts upon us here will one day be healed by the risen Christ. And that day will come when the answer to the question, will the dust praise you? God says yes, the dust will praise you.
For I will raise you from the dust of the earth, and I shall put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and death shall have no more place in you. And there shall only be life. I know Mark and Sherry look forward to that day, as do we all, when the dust rises to praise the Lord, and death is no more. Amen.